On this episode of Narcissist Apocalypse, we talk with an abuse survivor named Searsha, and Searsha was married to a narcissistic coercive controller. It's a story of manipulation, financial abuse, isolation, abuse of in-laws, and escape plans. Welcome to Narcissist Apocalypse, everyone. I am Brandon Chadwick, and with me today, we have Searsha. How are you? I'm good, thanks. How are you? I am doing well. And before we get to today's story, I hope you all have just one minute for me. And I hope that you've been enjoying the podcast. And I genuinely appreciate your continued support and engagement. And the goal of this show has been to always provide valuable stories and to maintain a thriving community that benefits each and every one of you. And over time, I've partnered with various advertisers that kept our show free of charge. But I feel that those partnerships really haven't represented the show or you, the community. And I believe that the key to overcoming this is understanding your needs and preferences better. So that way we can ensure that the products and services that are promoted on our show are genuinely valuable and relevant to you. So to that end, I've created a brief survey focused on understanding your needs and your participation in this survey will help identify the best suited advertisers for this podcast. So to participate in this survey, simply click on the link in our show notes. I know it will be in our show notes there and it'll be nicely posted in, in bold letters there for you. So thank you for being a part of our podcast journey and really just for all your continued support and for taking the time uh, to complete the survey. I really appreciate each and every one of you. So a really, really big thank you. So now back to today's story and we have a content warning for this episode. We discuss physical abuse and sexual coercion in this story. So a big content warning there. And also in this episode, we reference abuser types in this episode. And when we are doing so, we are referencing Lundy Bancroft's abuser types from his book, Why Does He Do That? And again, a big thank you to Searsha for being here. Now I'm going to get out of my way and your way. Searsha, the floor is now yours. Thanks, Brendan. Um... I suppose I'd like to just start by saying thank you and to your fabulous community, because if I didn't have you guys over the last couple of years, I'd still be insane. Um, so we'll start with my early childhood. So um, I was one of six children, middle child. Uh, it was a family run business that I grew up with. Um, the biggest thing that I suppose uh, held me back when I was small was I, I felt so different to everyone else because I physically looked different. To all my siblings, I had fair hair, blue eyes and pale skin and everyone else looked, you know, just so different that, you know, I was constantly teased. Was I adopted? Was I the milkman's daughter or the postman's daughter? And everyone thought that these were all funny little jibes. But to me, it was just reminding me, you know, that I didn't fit in and I didn't really belong. Um, a part of the, the physical differences was I uh, had a lot of ailments and I was sick quite a bit when I was small. And that kind of distanced me again some more from my siblings because I was in hospital a bit. I wasn't allowed to do things um, that they were allowed to do. I was protected a bit more. So as a result, I suppose my siblings were a little bit jealous of me. They thought I was getting more attention as I was going along. But to me, it was just keeping me even more distant from them more isolated from them and, um, you know, feeling that anger from them. It made me, you know, I suppose be quieter, be with, with more withdrawn as well so that um, I didn't engage in things as much because I didn't really know where I fitted in and where my place was. Um, I had a lot of responsibilities when I was small. Um, hearing from my younger siblings while everyone else would be working in the family business. Um, taking care of the house uh, on my own at night with them a lot when I was small. Um, as a result of this, then I didn't really play with friends my age. I was a lot more mature. I definitely was um, more of an adult than a child. So 
along with that, then, you know, I thought everyone else was childish, so I didn't relate to my peers. So that caused more distance again with friends and making friends and keeping friends. Um, and because I was on my own at home a lot at night with the kids, uh, instead of going to bed like a normal child at 10 or 11, I would eat my feelings. So um, at the time I came into that preteen and, you know, when your hormones are developing and everything, I was pretty obese for my age, which only exacerbated the feeling of not looking like everyone else, not belonging, not being um, good enough and pretty enough and, and all those things that go with it. Um, so when I got into secondary school, there was a lot of bullying. Um, I did stand out a lot from the crowd and um, I was very shy and very quiet. So I kind of stuck to my academics to kind of draw my attention to something and get approval for something because everything else was falling apart. Um, and then the family ran business uh, when I was working down there, the the treatment from some of the customers would definitely have affected me. Um, the emotional torment where, again, they would draw on my looks or comment about um, I would have been very opinionated and stubborn at the time. And they definitely bet that out of me by the comments that they would give back, telling me that I'm always giving out, which is an Irish term for like always complaining um, or that I was very bossy or that I was narky or, you know, so all those um, constant comments and putting me down, it, you know, affected my self-esteem. So I just learned to shut up and the customer was always right. Keep the peace and don't disturb things because it only draws more attention to me. And I did not like negative attention at, at any stage. Um, so yeah, that's really the early childhood part. Um, then I went to college when I was in college, the same kind of thing. Um, I stayed away uh, from home when I was in college as much as I could just to avoid the chaos and the busyness at home and not feeling like I fitted in. And, um, after college was finished, I decided instead of going working in my area that I just finished my degree in, that I'd go to America for the summer and uh, decided not to come back again to avoid the chaos. So we've heard everything about how, you know, not fitting in has affected you and all of that. But who are you, I guess, as a person at this point? Likes, dislikes, um, like if it was a free Saturday, what would you go and do? Oh, Brandon, free Saturday. No, in my house, we didn't have free Saturdays or Sundays. Um, we worked all the time. Kids always worked. Um, if you weren't in the business, you were at home. So um, didn't know who I was, didn't know what my likes and dislikes were. Um, wasn't involved in sports, um, had no extra extra curricular activities like music or art or anything like that. In my spare time at home, I definitely zoned out by listening to music and drawing pictures and painting. I used to like watching um, the TV shows that would teach you how to draw and teach you how to art. But everything was very by myself. It was keeping to myself. Didn't share it with anyone. Didn't. Um, it wasn't engaging with people. It was I because I was afraid of what people would say about me. You know, I thought everything about me was negative. So if I drew a picture, I wouldn't show it to anyone for fear I'd be criticised for that. So I kept it private. You know, 1970s and 80s, it's, it's, it's a different time. Um, kids were seen and not heard sort of thing. Um, and it was, we didn't know any different. I didn't know any different. I thought that that was normal. I thought other kids were lazy. I thought, you know, how, how, how come they can't, you know, cook a dinner at nine? Like, that's ridiculous that they don't know how to cook a dinner for 20 people at night, <laughs> you know? Um and I suppose with my parents, it was a case of they possibly didn't know any better either because of their upbringings and they were just repeating the cycle of what they knew. Um, yeah, so I don't know. It was keeping the peace. You never push back and said no to go do something else either. So when you went to university, I guess, what did you want to be when you grew up? Um. Again, there wasn't great guidance for what I wanted to be when I grew up. Um, it was paddling my own canoe, figuring that out for myself. <laughs> um, I had such a variety of um, applications sent into different colleges and universities because I did not know who I was or what I wanted to do. Um, 
And I suppose I drew on from my own disabilities. They are the areas I focused on because I could emotionally connect to people who would have any of those issues. And uh, that's how I ended up specialising in the health and safety sector to um, help support people with disabilities and make sure that they had what they need in workplace environments and social settings. So with everything that's happened in in your childhood and from how you feel about yourself to your role in your family to working all the time to the customer is always right, you're always dealing with the feelings of other people over your feelings and your worth isn't there and we'll eventually get into it but you know things have really been set up for you in the sense of finding yourself with someone who's going to be seeing you for the first time and paying attention to you and your needs for the first time and For a lot of people who grew up feeling like you did, having someone do that for the first time, you know, that person is going to look like the greatest person in the world. And a lot of faults or a lot of things won't be able to be seen. And a lot of things early on when people say, why does someone stay in in abuse and all those things, you know, at the beginning of these things, you know, everything is sunshine and roses and the way you've been seen is a feeling that would be like a feeling you've never felt before in your whole entire life. So when so when people end up in a relationship with an abuser, depending on who they are and what type they are, like things can really last a long time depending on what is in their arsenal and what they're using against you. And we'll eventually find out that yours had a, a large arsenal. Uh, the other things I'd say is uh, what I was modeled. Um, so my my dad was an alcoholic. Um, by the time I was small, I, he had stopped drinking, but I, I'd call it the, the, the dry drunk. You know, he still had the personality, still had the mannerisms. And my mom was definitely the codependent who just wanted to, you know, as I was doing, keep the peace, um, not not rock the boat, not cause any trouble. Um, there was the misogyny, the old fashioned Irish way of, you know, the men as the authority in the family, and um, we, you know, we're just there to keep house, kind of thing. So that's what I grew up with. I didn't really realize what I was, what I was mimicking, but I obviously was mimicking, you know being the people pleaser like my mother and just, you know, afraid of arguments, afraid of pushing back. So it's siblings that have pushed back. <laughs> um, and what I've seen when they push back, especially my my older sister, if she pushed back, my anxiety used to be horrendous for her and fear for her and her safety. So I learned to be quiet and taught my younger siblings to be quiet so that even that my older sister wouldn't be in harm's way because she would do everything to protect us. You know, so, and I could suppose I brought that bit into my future as well without knowing it. And eventually you wanted to get away from that and you went to school and you went to the United States. So what happens in this part of your life? Well, there was major love bombing and future faking and mirroring and everything that you talk about in your other podcast. So when we met, it was, you know, just a whirlwind. It was, you know... He had the same likes and hopes and dreams as me. He was so charming. He was charming to my extended family that lived in the States close by. Um, nothing was was too much. He had, you know, all the time in the world to help us out. And he was really sweet and kind. And um, I'd say we were footloose and fancy free. You know, we had no responsibilities. We had no ties. It was my first time being away from the family business where I didn't have to work Saturdays and Sundays. So this was just amazing to be able to go out for breakfast on a Sunday morning and go to the markets and, you know, go for a nice drive. You know, I just thought it was all exciting to me. And I'd found someone who, who he seemed to adore me. He, you know, he was so kind and sweet. Everything I wanted to hear, you know, that I was beautiful and that I was worth it and all the effort he put in, you know, it made me feel like I had really found one. Um. I didn't see any of the red flags at all. I know when I look back now, I see them, but I didn't at the start. Um, 
the one thing that it used to niggle at me at the time was that he wasn't good with the domestic side of things. Um, but I'd have always played it off that, oh, sure, it's only the two of us. I have loads of time. What else will I be doing? I like pottering around the house and tidying up. And, you know, there are things I'm good at. And I like cooking meals and, you know, doing the laundry. And I never picked up that it's just he didn't want to help. That, you know, I got suckered into it, I suppose. Um, and then uh, when we were organising our wedding, it was, you know, I was organising it. Was, was I organising it because I wanted to organise it? Or was it just that he didn't do anything and I, org- you know, it was all very confusing. I don't know, was I trying to be controlling of it or did he make it seem like I was controlling of it? But it was him that just couldn't be bothered doing anything, if that makes sense. Um, so, yeah, so he was very lazy and I just didn't pinpoint it at the time. Um and then, so when it had come to the finances, because we were building a house back in Ireland and planning our wedding in Ireland, um, I was trying to do the budgeting. I was trying to do the finances to, you know, pay our bills in the States and the bills at home in Ireland. And if I said that we can't go out this Saturday night, we can't afford it, we have to send money home for engineers or whatever was going on with the house being built. It was a childish tantrum that would be pulled that I'm controlling him and stopping him going out and that he's worked hard all week and why can't he go out? That You know, and it was, it, it, it stunned me. It would make me go into absolute freeze and I would just appease him and then I would spend a couple of weeks emotionally stressing about where am I going to find that money to pay back to whatever because he wanted to go out in the sash tonight. But it was all my fault in my head. Um, and then, um, if he was drinking, so what he'd do is he'd go a couple of weeks where he'd be fine. There'd be no real drinking. And then if he did drink, it was like, um, he'd drink too much and then it'd be, I don't appreciate him. I don't respect him. And it'd be just this chaotic night where I wouldn't sleep. I'd be up all night with anxiety, upset by the things he said. And then the next morning it would be, he doesn't want to talk about it and we should just let it go. And then I was in that tricky, tricky spot that everybody talks about where if I bring it up, I'm causing another argument or do I just keep the peace and move on and hope that it doesn't happen again and that he didn't mean it because it was drink. It wasn't really him. Um, I don't know. I think I was just scared to go there. Was I scared to go there? Because when I was small, you know, when I seen arguments at home, when I seen arguments in the family business that I just the safest option was just to, again, be quiet and not antagonise and, and and cause any further hardships on myself. It was easier to just leave it be. Um, and lack of confidence in myself, I suppose, as well, you know, um, that I was worth more, that I deserved to be treated better. You know, all the, his talk about him not respecting me was actually the other way around. So all of these things are happening and then eventually you get pregnant. Yeah. So in 2006, this was the deciding part of moving back to Ireland, newborn baby. Um, During the pregnancy, I worked my tushy off to do all the organizing from packing to scheduling all the utilities, everything being closed off. It's an awful lot of work moving countries and I wanted to try and have it done before the baby was born. And um, the financial strain of it was all falling on me and knowing that I was going to be finishing up work, I was trying to preempt and pre-organize. And uh, then he'd do stupid things like he'd want to change the car because he wanted a different car. And then I'm left with trying to figure out this budget. And if I tried to, again, stop it and say, you know, we can't afford that or it doesn't make sense. It would be, again, I'm controlling everything. I'm telling him what to do. He works hard. Why can't he get what he wants? And um, then when the baby was born, um, you know, he, he was tiny. He was a very tiny baby. He had a few bits going on when he was small. The first month was really difficult. And he just, he never engaged. It was like he detached rather than attached. Um, didn't do night feeds. Um, didn't really help out, used work a lot, but kind of made the excuse that he was working more to earn more money before we moved home. And I justified it in my head. Yeah, he's right. You know, I'm not working now and he needs to, but it wasn't, you know, now like 
if any other dad would be dying to spend time with their newborn baby and getting to know them and build that bond. It just wasn't there. Um, and then just the responsibility, I just felt like it was all on me. But the baby felt it too. Um, there's one time in particular, I just said, I need to go for a walk. I'm going to go to CVS and get a few bits and leave you with him for a couple hours. And next thing he's ringing and he's screaming down the phone that I need to get back, that the baby won't stop crying and everything. But it was just the baby could feel it. The baby could feel the stress and the tension and the, and as soon as I come back, the baby was totally fine. And then again, it's, oh, you know, he, he just wants you. He doesn't want me. Why should I even bother trying? And it was just like this massive wedge where it was me and the baby on one side and, and him over the other. And it was so stressful because then I'm like, am I meant to be choosing the baby or pleasing him? Who who am I meant to give my time to? And again, reinforcing I'm not good enough. I'm not a good enough wife and I'm not a good enough mother because nobody seems to be happy in this room right now. Um, and that was very hard. And then when we moved back to Ireland, the house wasn't ready. So we had to move in with his parents. Um, I had only really known them for a week, a year, for the five years we were living in Boston. He had never spoke badly about them. He had never said, you know, anything about issues with attachment with them. I would have spoken about my childhood and everything, but he had never. So I was just under the presumption that they were lovely that they were kind, that they were going, you know, I'm so excited to build a house next door to them and have our kids grow up beside grandparents. Because when I was growing up, my paternal grandmother was my world. You know, me and my siblings used to have arguments about who was going to uh, have the sleepover at her house on the Friday night and get all the treats and the attention from her. And I had this vision that my kids would have this. Um, but no, that definitely didn't happen. Um when we moved home and moved in with them, my God, it was the biggest eye opener. I I felt so stuck. I felt like, what is going on? What did I do to deserve this? Why do they hate me? I could feel the hate. I could feel the the lack of love and care for me and the baby. Um, he was very difficult. As soon as I stopped breastfeeding, he was he was very sick. He was allergic to all the milks. I was in and out to the health center to try and get him tested and see you know what's going on and um they never they never supported never gave me time to rest never helped out um constantly just criticizing like my cooking my parenting they thought breastfeeding was disgusting they never they never supported any of that um so there was a lot of silence and isolation from them where I'd be in the house and there'd just be pure tension and when I would say this to my ex, it would be, oh, never mind them. They're just old fashioned. You know, I don't think like that. So don't worry about it. So he looked like he was all sweet. But at the same time, he wasn't defending me. He wasn't protecting me. He wasn't reassuring me that, um, you know, we're OK. It was it was him and them against me and the baby. And um, I found that very, very hard. Um, I think that the, that they were having like imaginary conversations with me that I was never involved in because I'd come into the room and I'd be like, why aren't they talking to me today? And I'd be going over and over conversations from the previous few days or week. And I'd be exhausted trying to figure out what did I do wrong that they're not talking to me today? Like I never knew what was going on. Um, so a lot of devaluing, a lot of control and um, chipping away at my self-worth even more than it was to begin with. He's going to be this very controlling person and his family is the secondary form of control here where most likely he is triangulating between you and he's also probably smearing you to them and they themselves can act also independently uh, you know, as a devaluing uh, entity and a controlling uh, party as well, without him even being there, you know. So you're you're not just getting it from one side, and you're you're getting it from this other group of people, which. You know, as you said, you you're starting to think about what am I doing wrong? What am I doing wrong? And now you're in these cycles of 
even when you're away from them, your mind is racing. Yeah. That's causing stress. That's causing problems. And you're also not getting help from them when, you know, you hope that at least you're going to get a little bit of help from your in-laws or grandparents or, or things like that. Well, they were very, like, they just did very nasty things. Like, so when the baby was sick and I was in and out to the health nurse getting those tests done, I didn't communicate it with them because they weren't helping me. And then behind my back, she actually reported me to the GP and the health nurse that I wasn't taking care of my baby. And it was the health nurse that rang me and said, pack your bags and run. And made me go home to my parents, which was two hours away, because my mental health was not good. Like, you know, I had all the postnatal depression. I was in such a dark place and they, they did not help it. You know, they'd have comments about, you know, that all these women that uh, complain about postnatal depression, it's all in their heads. They're just looking for attention. And it was just like, I couldn't even say out loud, I'm depressed. I don't feel well. I need support. Um, and then when I did move back, when the house was ready, their house was next door. And I drove down the street to pass by. And all my things and my baby's things were dumped out on their front street. And they sat inside, drinking tea, looking out the window, at me shamelessly picking up everything belonging to me and my baby to put into the car and nothing of it. It was just like it was a normal day. And when I did say this to my ex, I got the same line again. Never mind them. They're just old fashioned. I don't think anything of it. Never confront them. Never back me up. So I was screwed. Moving into a new house with a new baby in a new country in a in a village two hours away from my own family and friends and you nobody and I was completely isolated and controlled. So eventually you then have a second baby. So what happens from here? So we had a beautiful baby girl um, and just from the minute she was born little things like they didn't even come to the hospital to see her. So again, he made excuses for that. And where's the first place we had to go? As sore as I was and exhausted as I was coming out of hospital, I had to stop at their house to bring the baby in to show them rather than them come to our house. And we brought the baby in, put the baby up on the table in the car seat and they didn't even bother to get up off their chairs and walk over to see her. Didn't take her out, didn't want to hold her, nothing. And I was like, is this because it's a girl? Is this... Is, it, is there major misogyny going on here that it's all about the boys and it's, you know, the girls aren't important? I, I just couldn't figure it out. Um, and then again, the comments about breastfeeding is disgusting. So they wouldn't come down and visit. So they wouldn't come down and help with the toddler. So I was doubly exhausted because I had this toddler by myself and he, he was no help. He left to go to work, any excuse to go to work. Um, when he was there, I wanted him to leave because he was so hard on the toddler. Um, you know, the way toddlers always regress a bit when a new baby is born. They're looking for your attention. They want reassurance. And he'd be yelling at him. He'd be criticizing them. And so then I wanted him to leave and go to work. I would rather do it by myself and make sure that the toddler is OK um, rather than have him involved. Um, I, I don't know, just like... Little things like they'd come in then without knocking on the door. They just invaded my privacy when it suited them. Um, and one time I invited them for dinner and it was the last time I invited them for dinner because they came with their own meat, their own cooked chicken and would not eat my food for fear I'd poison them. Like it was just all levels of craziness that I was, I never knew what to do. And then... Throughout the years, you know, I, I just gave up. It was like, what's the point? I'll do what I want to do. I, there's, there's no point trying. There's no pleasing them. So then I was definitely outcast because I didn't please them. I did my own thing. Um, my ex was so helpful to absolutely everybody else. His parents, the neighbours, you know, he, he just looked like this. Oh, he's so sweet. Oh, he's so kind. Oh, you're so lucky. And I'd be there going, he does nothing at home. He helps me with nothing. I'm exhausted. I'm not going to say that. I'm just like, oh, yeah, he is. Yeah, he's lovely. Um, as long as he got attention, he didn't care about me or the kids at this stage. Um, and then the kids didn't like going up to visit either. Um, they were very much like 
resisting going up to visit his parents' house. And that caused extra arguments then because, you know, it was me stopping them. I'm saying things about his parents behind his back. And it wasn't. It was kids are smart. They feel energy. They know if their mom isn't being treated right, they're feeling them feelings and they don't want to be there. Um, And there was always negative talk in that house. There'd always be bitching about neighbours and friends and they, they talked about everybody all the time. And that's the one thing in my house that you weren't allowed to do was because of the family ran business. You weren't allowed to talk about people. It was so I, I was no good at that. Um, the other things that started when um, the second child was born was um, the pressure around sex. Which was extremely difficult um, to the point that he even said, uh, if you don't give it to me, I'll go find it somewhere else. And all that did is reassure me that I have to just appease or he's going to leave me and two kids and I don't even have a job now. How am I going to provide for them? And if he doesn't help now, he's definitely not going to help when I leave. How do I go on? And then somehow like, so he says that and I block it out and I pretend he never said it. And I just become this, you know, happy little housewife that just does what she's told and, you know, more devaluing and controlling and the the shame that goes with that, that, you know, he doesn't even value me as a person. I am just, I'm just an object. You know, my feelings were, here I am, I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough, not good enough wife, not good enough mother, I'm not good enough daughter-in-law. I need to do better. I need to do more. I, I am not doing enough. So instead of asking anybody for help, I did everything by myself thinking, well, if I take the pressure off him and I don't ask him, I don't ask his parents, I don't ask anyone, they'll think I'm okay and I'm good enough. Um, Never seeing that what they were doing was shit. Never seeing what they were doing was wrong. It was, I was wrong. You know, um, when I did try to talk to him about things, you know, the conversations would get so chaotic and I ended up apologising for stuff that had nothing to do with what the conversation started with. Um, his aggression used to get heightened. So I would straight away want to appease him and, and calm him down because it triggered something in me that I didn't want the kids to be witnessing him screaming. I didn't want them to see an argument. I just wanted calm. And so he knew that. So like that about he's going to find it somewhere else or is this what a marriage is about? And he'd take his ring off and put it on the mantelpiece. They were all tactics that I fell for. So, you know, a lot of things that you're dealing with here, you're obviously isolated. There's sexual coercion going on. You're trapped at this point. You know, there's financial control, you know, two kids and you stop working uh, you've got neglect going on as well. You're codependent, you know, you, your, your self-worth from what came into the relationship with as far as, you know, what your needs are. You're still working to think that you need to please him more instead of taking care of your own needs. And you're dealing with someone who really doesn't want a family but has created a, a family and he just wants the vanity of it, if that makes sense, you know, for everyone yeah. to see him as this family man when, yeah. you know, he comes from a terrible family and he himself, it, it, everything is for show. And there was a lot of triangulation on in his family too with his siblings. So his mother was playing them all off each other. So he craved being on the good side of that triangle. He craved appeasing her. It was the biggest high he was getting. And that was that was my job was to make sure that I was helping him with that angle and and doing what he needed to do to have her approval. And it was never about his family unit. It was never about us as a team, as a partnership. It was about pleasing his mother. And it was it, it became then that it was my hyper focus rather than my marriage it was my focus was I have to please her you know I got I got sucked into this that everything revolves around her and I have to make sure that I'm the good girl and and you know it was just it was so stressful it was it was chaotic so then when he was begging then for a third child I put this off for years because 
I was just like, no, can things improve? No. And maybe if I don't, I can get out quicker or whatever. Um, and think things, I thought that this settled, but I think it was what I became a master at making sure I appeased and did what I needed to do to stay safe. And then I somehow convinced myself that things had got better. And then here comes baby number three, six years later. And he's all excited. Now I know it's what he's excited because, hey, doesn't it make him look like a great family man again? And with me, I'm excited that it's OK. This is a fresh start. This is, you know, things will be better. I was so upset after everything that happened with our second baby. You know, I thought that this would be, you know, a, a nice way of addressing it. Um, and but even when I was pregnant, it went belly up, you know, his lack of care for me and the baby um, not minding us, um, you know, just like he'd go out drinking near the end of the pregnancy when I'd ask him not to because I, with my other two, I went two weeks early. So I knew that there was a high risk of this happening again and I didn't want him drinking. We were an hour away and I needed, obviously, someone to bring me and be there for me. And he would on purpose leave leave me upset and crying and go off and not come back for the night and go off with friends drinking and um and then the next day it, it was again I wouldn't address it because I didn't want to be stressing myself out with a baby coming because the baby would feel my stress so I wouldn't have an argument about it um and then you know I'd ask him to stay working locally rather than traveling away for work and he wouldn't do that it wasn't a priority to him and that would upset me and make me feel like I didn't, I didn't come first and the baby definitely didn't come first. And that we had two other kids that needed help and minding and, you know, a bit of rest at the end of a pregnancy would be nice if I had a bit more support in the evenings. I was doing six days and six nights a week on my own when he was away. Like, that's a lot. You're getting no mental downtime. You're, you're carrying the mental load and the physical load. And I have no help from his family. So I am all alone in this village, two hours away from my family and pretending to my own family as well, by the way, at the time that he was so helpful and I'd say stupid things. And like now, like my family are like, we never believed you. We always thought he was a dick. <laughs> you know, I'd be saying, oh, we work so hard and they'd be rolling their eyes going, we all work hard. That doesn't mean you don't care for your wife and kids. You know, um, it was just, it was all about him. Um, and then, uh, I don't know, just the, the exhaustion and the stress. I tried to again pretend that it wasn't happening. And then I started getting a bad back. And then I had to have major back surgery um, and have a disc removed and nerve reconstruction. I was in a pretty bad way. Not one day did he take off work to help me with all the kids. My best friend did it all. And there was just no regard, like he, he, never have empathy for me being in pain it was always like unless it was him in pain it wasn't pain um and then found out during the back injury that I was actually pregnant again and I ended up miscarrying and guess what he did he blamed me it was all my fault I didn't hold on I should have done more and that absolutely broke me because you know Nobody causes a miscarriage. Nobody wants a miscarriage. I should have had all the support and love and care from him. But again, what did he do? Went straight back to work. And left me mourning the loss of a child with a major back injury that I was waiting for surgery on. And just no emotional connection, no support. It wasn't about him, so it didn't count. Um, then my family started getting very quiet and distant after this because they were sick of it. But their approach was if they confronted me I'd take his side and they knew that so they were trying to stay quiet and pull back hoping that I'd see if you know without their support because they were always having to come out and give help you know when babies were born my mother was out it was always them having to take the weight of the load um, they were hoping that I'd see it and admit it but it still wasn't working so I was under complete control um, making the excuses again um, then I'd start like praising him in public with his friends and everything, hoping that that would make him feel better. And like, when I look back at it, it's like, why did I do this? And then I started doing the opposite, where if there was something that bugged me at home, 
I'd feel it safer to say it in public and I'd have a little jibe and I'd say it in public. But I was hoping that the people that I said it in front of would go, are you OK? Are things OK? You know, um, you get these micro expressions off them. It was like the biggest fast glint. It would be a fur of the eyebrow. The eyes would go dark for a second. The facial expression would change, but it was so fast. Only I would pick up on it. But I knew I was screwed. That told me when I get home, I'm in massive trouble. I've gone too far. I've said something I shouldn't have in public and I'm going to pay for it when I get home. Um, and my kids became very hyper attuned to these micro expressions as well. Um, you know, the way like when you were small and your, your mother would grind her teeth at you in public, like, you know, wait till I get you home. It wasn't like that. It was so fast. It was so intense. And because we were tuned, we knew what it meant. We picked it up where everyone else didn't. Um, and then I started doing things like, you know, putting up positive things about him on Facebook. Like, oh, he's a doting father and he's a lovely husband and happy birthday, this and that. And I think, why did I do it? Again, thinking that I was getting his approval, that, you know, this would make him happy. This will make him see that we love him. This will make him... Um, Um, and be kind to the kids and and all this but it didn't he just found something new all the time to pick on all the time to criticize Um, and then you know little things like there was just no natural affection it wasn't safe affection it wasn't kind you know if he touched me I knew we were okay but I also knew I had to perform if he didn't touch me even just a gesture on the hand or you know if I was doing the dishes and come up if he wasn't physically at me I knew that there was going to be trouble in the house. I knew that the kids were going to be criticised about something. Um, So my main focus then became on, I have to make sure that I'm getting affection so that I know the kids aren't going to get in trouble and he's not going to pick on them. You know, then he did get the idle threats to leave. He was very good at that anytime I'd say things, but then it escalated where he'd comment on my looks. Um, I killed myself all the time trying to lose weight. I I was constantly on the diet. And he'd never say I looked well. So I always thought I needed to try harder. I wasn't doing enough. Um, then he'd, you know, he'd never directly, he was very good at the little whistles around, never directly criticise what I was wearing. But he'd find someone else that was wearing what I'd wear and he'd comment about how old fashioned they look or sloppy they look or frumpy they look. And then in my head, and well, I have that outfit, he's talking about me too, so I can't wear that again. So he could never say, he said to me, I was fat or sloppy or frumpy, but he was doing it in his own little roundabout way. And he used to do the same thing about his friends' wives. He'd he'd criticise something about them like, oh, she has him under the thumb. He can't even go to the pub tonight. She's so controlling. So it wasn't saying it about me, but it was telling me in an indirect way, don't you stop me going to the pub. Don't you tell me I can't go out tonight because then you're controlling. Um, and I fell for it, fell for it every time. And um, then as I got wiser and more confident, as the kids got older and they started voicing to me about them being unhappy and that they don't like the way daddy speaks to mommy, he um, would start the you don't appreciate me and start the sulking and little silly comments that were suicidal in a roundabout way. And then that would make me shut up because, oh, my God, I don't want anything to happen to him like that. Um, and then going out. I dreaded nights out with him, especially special occasions like weddings and things like that, because, um, again, they were all about him and I'd have a miserable night. So what's interesting about him, Mm -hmm. and we talked about this in our pre-call, when I went through all of the abuser types with you, is that he hit on seven of the nine for you and you know at this point everyone's been listening to your story and time has passed people might not realize how much time has passed here but we're talking right now you know a good 10 years has at least passed in 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 your marriage at this point maybe a little bit more and he is constantly you know if you're listening Things are trickling in. It's slower moving in the sense of how this escalation is happening. And he's changing. So tactics that were being used early 
might stick around, but other things are appearing when other things stop working. And he's a very chameleon-like. And here now we're getting to this sulking stuff. You know, he's now kind of reverting into more of a infantile child in, in the sense of trying to get what he wants. He's, he's figuring things out and changing on the fly, which I think is very difficult for people who are in abusive relationships to, to deal with. Because once you get used to one specific type of thing, you're kind of ready to combat that in some sort of way or you have a good understanding of what's going on. But when you're in a situation where things are changing, it will be catching you off guard. So, you know, you're continuing to um, appease him in whatever way he's looking to be appeased because these new things are flying at you. And you yeah. don't know how to deal with them yet. You're you're not sure how to step around them or step into them or call them mm-hmm. out because it, it's just ever changing and it's going to continue to change. I mean, he's figured things out. He's very good at what he's doing. And, and I just kind of wanted to point that out for everyone uh, who's listening because this can keep you in a relationship for a very long time. And it's hard to locate your emotions in a lot of these cases because when those things are happening, it's just, oh, you have to switch and pivot and you're not thinking about yourself now. You know, he's figured out a new way for me to think about him first. Yeah. So like you said, the abuser types, uh, I think by the time I finished doing my notes, it was nine out of the nine. He was the utter comedian. (laughs) When we do, when we talked about it, uh, because um, there was different things he was triggering in me at each of the abuser types, different vulnerabilities in me that were showing up, and he seeing my reaction no more than me seeing his micro expressions. He obviously seen mine, and he'd like, oh, I'll hold on to the, that little part of that abuse because that worked nicely for me. I'll use that again, and this part didn't work, so I'll drop that. And that's why he was transitioning as well was to keep up with my strength. I know that now. At the time, I thought it was all my weaknesses, but it was, it, you know, he was trying to perfect his art because I was protecting myself and the kids so much as we went along. Um, then, so we're at, so we're at 2018 now. So we're like, we're about 15, 16 years in. Baby number four comes. Um, he is my, I call him my gift from God. Um he was my saving grace for after the back surgery and everything. I really did want this baby. I wanted the third baby to have a little buddy because of the age difference with the older two. Um, so I was super excited about this baby. I didn't really, I wasn't phased by what he'd throw at me or anything. I was just, I was on a high. I was so happy and grateful that I was able to get pregnant after the surgery, that I was fit and healthy and strong. Um, I had taken such good care of my body to get ready for this pregnancy. And um, when the baby was born, um, the baby had to be born with me under um, anesthetic because of the back injury. I couldn't have a natural delivery this time. And um, when I woke after the C-section, when I woke, he had the baby named with the birth cert register rather than wait for me, a decision with me. It was like, what I lost it. it. This was me with reactive abuse at its best. I'm trapped in a bed, physically can't move. And here he is naming the baby of the name I did not want and made very clear I did not want. And um, he started the crying like a baby tactic for me to change my mind. And um, I shut down. I didn't want to talk to him. I didn't want to see him. I was I was so upset that he would actually stoop that low after all I physically went through to to do that. It was so deceitful. It was so controlling. But it it drew a line in something because this was my baby and it was just like, no, this is not happening. And I made him go back and change it. I was not I was not having that as his name on the birth cert. Um 
Then as the kids got older, after the fourth baby was born, you know, the, the two older ones were gone into, you know, they were 10 and no, yeah, 10 and, and 14 at the time. Um, they knew their own minds. The blessings were that I was a stay at home mom for them 14 years. So um, they knew who they were. They had so they had the biggest abundance of love and care and um, emotional connection with me that they felt safe in themselves. They could say anything to me. Um, and they started figuring out they didn't like the way he was treating them and the way he was treating me. Um, so we started calling family meetings. So these family meetings, whoever had the remote control spoke so that there was respect. And, you know, if there was arguments going on between siblings or, you know, if I was peed off at one of them about something, this was our chance to talk. So the older kids would say, you know, mom, you're getting me to do the dishes all the time and that's not fair. Or, you know, he's always taken my football jersey, whatever arguments there was, we'd, we'd hash it out. But if anyone criticized him, he would get up, slam the door and his words to his children would be, fuck the lot of ye, do whatever the fuck ye like. And I'd be like, you're throwing your toys out of the cot because your kids are saying they don't like the way you speak to them or whatever. Can you not like listen to them and apologize, take accountability and try better? That's all they're asking for. And no, nope, he'd storm off, go to his mammy's, his favorite place to go when he needs rescuing and, and attention. And he'd just abandon his kids and they'd feel such rejection. And again, it's just me there to do the repair. He'd never come back and apologize. So he was teaching them that he's allowed to say what he likes and that it doesn't matter how he hurts their feelings. Um, but little did he know that also shows them right from wrong. And they, they have that in the house. They have that safety net of me in the house. And they also have that safety net with their friends' dads. They see the way their friends' dads talk to their friends and their, their friends' little sisters. So they have a baseline of what's right and wrong. And, um, you know, the more he yelled at them, the more he mocked them, he'd snigger at them, he'd call them names, he'd be trying to control what they watched on TV or taking their mobile phones. The more he tried, the more that they were just awoke to, we don't like this. We're not, they never backed down. They were just like, no, take my phone. I don't care. They'd never bend over backwards to appease him to get the phone back. They were just like, take the phone. Don't mind. Um, and then it came to the stage where they came to me and they're like, mommy, you need to go back working. We need to work together to figure this out. So when he was away during the week, we, you know, they were helping me with the smaller babies, like to the point that they'd help put them to bed or do the dishes or whatever. So I went back into the office studying. I would be applying for jobs online. I'd be doing interviews and getting rejected. And I just kept pushing and pushing and pushing. I need to get a job. I need to get us to a place where we can get out of this and stand on our own um you know and it was it just it just it got worse it got vulgar it got gross to the point where our ensuite um in our bedroom the toilet doors facing my side of the bed and he would purposely wait until I was gone to bed at night and he'd come up and he'd go sit on the toilet with the door open and would sit there making a bowel movement while I'm trying to go to sleep directly in front of me, about three foot away. And I would lose plot, like you're disgusting, that's disrespectful. And he'd start the big man cave. It's the rage would really come out. He'd be banging on his chest. Who the fuck do you think you are telling me I can shit in whatever toilet in this house I like and you're not going to tell me what to do. And then I'd be up all night. I'd be full of anxiety. He would continue an argument for about three hours and then he'd go to sleep, no problem. And I would have ended up again apologizing for something that was nothing to do with the conversation about the bathroom. And I'm the worst in the world. And I'm just so exhausted. Like, I can't keep doing this. Um, chewing in my ear. He'd follow me around the house, chewing his food in my ear. And he knew that I didn't like it. It would really annoy me. So he did it on purpose just to... So he wanted all the reactive abuse. He was trying to make me out to be the crazy person um, texting and driving. And the kids would tell me that he was texting and driving on, on his own in the car with them. And then that would enrage me because I was all about safety with the kids. Any occasion, he'd be ruining it. You know, trips in the car to go anywhere, he'd be ruining it. He'd, he'd cause arguments to spin the car around, drive really fast. And we're not going doing that anymore. You're all disrespectful. 
and go home and kids would be upset that they didn't get to go to the pet farm or do whatever activity it was. Um, you know, sniggering. He'd, he had some really horrible comments like he'd say to myself and the kids, like if we brought up something that um, he did, it'd be, oh, dry up, will you? Or, you know, um, stop being such a drama queen or, you know, you're you're such a moaner. You know, like, so he was degrading the kids if they brought up something as well. It, it was just all, so we ended up just shutting up. He also started to get more physical with me, pushed me off the bed one time in an argument. Um, after that, I wanted to go to counselling. So he went to one counselling session with me where he pled a blinder with the counsellor, telling the counsellor, you know, she pointed out, you don't take accountability for bills. You don't help out with anything. Um, you need to be more supportive, whatever. So he came home, oh, I need to do this and I need to do that. And, and then... Like I thought, oh, great, this is going to help. And then wouldn't go back for counselling and used the excuses that we couldn't afford it, that I just wanted to get him pumped full of drugs or that I just wanted someone to gang up on him with. You know, it wasn't about helping us communicate better, helping the marriage, having the kids grow up in a safe, happy environment. It was all about him, him, him. Um, And then I started gaslighting myself because I was like, I'm definitely... I'm crazy, you know, how can he be telling me he's this nice person, but I don't see it and I don't feel it. But everybody in the community thinks he's lovely. How are we meant to get out of this? Um, he started sending Snapchats of our smallest, the, the, the youngest baby in the car and he'd be in the front seat with no car seat, no seat belt, and he'd be driving down the main road. And I'd go up to him when I'd get home going, what the hell are you doing? Why are you putting the baby without a car seat? That's so dangerous. And he'd physically push me up into the wall, tell me to shut the fuck up, my, my own business, nothing to do with me. He'll do what he likes when he's minding the kids. It's none of my business. And, you know, it, it just came to the stage where it just got so nasty. I I had to start doing something. I couldn't keep going. Um, So then the the last straw was, um, and I think this was my, my major trigger where, oh, my worry for my babies just got away too much. Um, my daughter didn't want to play a football match. And I went into the sitting room to tell him she's not feeling well. She's not going to play the match today. And he turned around and he said, um, she fucking is going to play. And he bangs on his chest. I've paid the insurance. I've paid the membership. She is going to play. And I'm like, no, she's not. She's sick. Leave her alone. And to de-escalate the argument I went to leave the living room and the three younger kids were in the car and he came out and took my keys and he threw them into the garden when I went down the garden to get them he got one of the kids bike helmets and whacked me with it and then when I got back up to the car to get into the car I could see my oldest girl's face and her you know her little face had dropped she was scared and I got into the car and I'm saying to her it's okay we're okay we're going to leave now. And next thing he took the baby out of the back of the car. And he stood in front of the car holding the baby so I couldn't leave. And he had this dark, dark look in his eyes. And I had to make a very quick choice, you know. I I had to turn off the car and tell my daughter to get out, take my hand, we're going to walk off. And I had to leave my two boys at the house and just take the two girls and walk off. And I'm like, I am so screwed. I really need to get this job. Like, how am I going to get away from him? Like, he used his baby as bait to control me and stop me leaving. And like, whatever about the arguments between me and him, fair enough, we're adults. You don't use a baby. Like, what if I did use rage? What if I did put my foot down on that pedal? Like, what if he had me to that brink of there's no return? Why was it always me that had to be the one in control and calm and make sure that the kids were okay? I couldn't keep doing it. The exhaustion was way too much. So that was it. That was, I, I, I was making the plan. And I got a job. Not a great job. Um, not in a great place. Not with great money. But I have to start somewhere. Um, he had actually changed jobs and uh, had moved home. And uh, so I thought, oh, my God, this might be the new beginning. He'll connect with the kids. He'll build a relationship with them. And then 
we won't be arguing all the time and I'll have help at home and we'll both have an income. This will be amazing and it'll be, you know, shared care. And this is what I dreamed of. This is all I wanted for the kids was, you know, memories with mommy and daddy and, you know, us both working together. And um, but soon after it started, I'd come in the door from work and the kids would all be sitting on the stairs and I'd be like, what's going on? And they'd have these little sad faces. And then they'd be missing me. It'd take 45 minutes to get out of the hallway and even get into the living room or the kitchen where they'd all need my time and cuddles and talking to me. And I, I couldn't understand it. Like, he's there. Why, like, what's going on? But they weren't forthcoming with what was going on with them. They were just saying that they missed me. Um, And then, like, there was one night then that I was up putting this, the small kids in bed. So that'd be the one-year-old and three-year-old. And he came into the room and the two of them were crying and I was crying because I was exhausted. I was doing a 13 hour day between travel and the job for crap money. The kids weren't happy. I wasn't happy. And I was lying in the bed saying, I don't think this is working. You know, everybody is miserable. I don't know if this is the right move. And the three of us are crying and he stands there and he just becomes an absolute fire of rage. He starts banging on his chest again. And he's like, my job, my job. You can fucking suck it up. I've paid the bills for the last 13 years, 14 years. It's your turn now. You can see what it's fucking like to worry about everything. And he walked off and left us all crying. I'm like, this is, what is wrong with him? So I settled the kids, put them to bed and I start looking for another job. Another job that pays more money, that's closer to home. And I make it my mission. Like I even have vision boards, like I'm... I'm like, I'm not giving up. I can't leave this job. He's hiding his money. He's not putting it in for the bills at this time. It, it really trickled slowly that I was like, why is it just me? I'm not saving any money. Where's all his money going? And he's throwing jibes like saying that I'm, I hid money for years. It's his turn now. And it's like, I never hit money. I paid the bills. He doesn't pay the bills. He doesn't know the cost of bills. And, um, but because then I was working all these crazy hours, and then when I came home, he had nothing done domestically. I'd have to do that. I was even isolated more because now I was exhausted. I was doing everything around the house and working full time. He was off doing God knows what not and picking fights when I was there so that he could leave. And the kids weren't happy. It was it, it, the, the chaos was just, I was like, how am I going to do this? I need a better job. Um when he was there, he was majorly obsessed with watching TV and being on his phone. Um, but yeah, I definitely was the single parent. There was no, there was no joint effort even with him at home full time. So then, this is the part where I say, "Mama Bear arrives." Um, I, I, I had had enough, and the kids had had enough. But my my fourteen year old son, he was making it very official. He rang me at work. I had got a new job. It was close to home, loved my boss, loved the company, had better income and better progression potential as well in this company. And so my son seen that I was a lot more settled and he rang me and said, we're done. This is it, mom. You need to kick him out. If you don't kick him out, I'm leaving and I'm making sure that the others come with me. And I was like, you have to leave it with me. I need to figure this out. We need to put a plan in place. Um, and then, um, you know, when I started talking to him, he's like, you know, he's he's got two voices. He's got the voice we hear, mom, and then he's got the voice that everyone else hears. And But we never hear the other voice anymore. You're gone all day to work and, and he's mean. He had no um, respect for the rules around COVID. So that caused major anxiety in the kids. It made them worse. They were trying to homeschool. He had no respect for that. He'd be making them do chores and mind the smaller kids he'd leave the house to do whatever rather than them do their schooling like they were meant to do um, and they were keeping it all a secret so that I wouldn't be upset and you know call it out when I'd get home from work and you know make things worse on them um, they used to do uh, things that like um, their hypervigilance was so bad they'd text each other or snapchat each other in the morning before they got out of bed to tell each other what kind of mood he was in so they'd hide in their rooms or pretend they were sick so they didn't have to deal with them. Imagine in their own home rather than, you know, get up and watch TV in their pajamas and eat a bowl of cereal and be happy. It was they hid in their rooms. And as soon as I got home, 
they'd be wherever I was. So if I was in the sunroom, they were in the sunroom. If I was in bed, they were up lying on bed with me. They were never in the same room as him, but they were still keeping the secrets of what was going on and not telling me the full story. Um, so the following week, my son had to have um, major leg surgery um, for a sports injury. He was very stressed about having this surgery um, because if it didn't go well, it meant he couldn't play sport anymore. And sport was this kid's life, like to a massive point. It was his life because it was his friendships. It was his de-stress. It was his get out of the house and enjoy himself. And um, my ex decided to announce by text two days before the operation that he needed a break and he was going to France to work for the week. And I'm like, what about the surgery? And he's like, what about it? Figure it out. And to the point where I, my, my response was, so you take a week off to take care of your fucking mother because she broke her finger, but your own child and the other kids at home that need care, you're abandoning us. And he's like, not my problem. And he left the whole week. We went in to have surgery and he didn't even text or call his own child to see if he was okay. And that was me. I was done. Could treat me like shit. But no, I was done. That little kid, like 14 years of age and feeling like his own dad didn't care about him. That was huge. The neglect of that was so huge. So the following day, I rang my boss and I told him what was going on and he said, take whatever time you need. My advice to you would be go to a therapist. Um, but you need to be very honest with this therapist. You need to tell them stuff that you're not telling anyone else and you need to trust their advice and roll with it. This is too big. And then his other advice was the kids are keeping stuff from you and you need to give them freedom and permission to say it to you. So I went straight to a therapist and um, it was Friday the 13th and I divulged for the first time to this therapist everything that was going on. I must have sounded so chaotic. It was just, and he did this and he said this and he did this and he said that. And he just said, you're in an abusive relationship and I fear for you and your children's safety and you need to get out and you need to get out fast. And with that, it was like, right, okay. Went home and told my parents and uh, sat the kids down and I explained what coercive control was and what the therapist said. And next thing, the kids came out with all these multiple affairs he had been having for the two years during COVID while I was at work. And they were like little tiny detectives who had done all the groundwork and had all the evidence. And it's what he was bullying them to keep them quiet. And I was traumatized. I was so upset that kids had to go and tell their mother this. Like, no kid should have to tell their mother this. And um, then... Uh, my dad begged me to go to the police, they're called the guards in Ireland, to put a plan in place and get advice because I had opened up about holding the baby in front of the car and pushing me and pinning me against the wall and stuff. So we told the police and they, you know, went through how you need a protection order and safety order and all the legalities of it and advised us to have the kids um, not in the house and have the bags packed. So we did all of that. And my best friend was with me and my oldest child wouldn't leave. He wanted to stay with me. So we came home on the Monday and uh, when he came in, we told him and he just went crazy. He, you know, kicked in a door, you shout and roaring, again, threatened to commit suicide. And it was all our fault in front of the child um, that he was fucking off to America and uh, that he wanted the house sold and half the house there was nothing about wanting shared custody of the kids. It was nothing about, it was just, it was all about him and his needs. And he went in and out of the house, slamming doors, but 10 times, every time he came in, there was something else he was saying. And I was just numb and zoned out in the corner, didn't react, didn't say anything. And that's not what he wanted. He wanted me to react. He wanted me to beg him to stay or whatever, but it was just, no, I was so done. And, um, then when he left, I had to go get a protection order and um, then you, the protection order is for a month. I don't know what it's like in Canada or in the States, 
but it's only for a month, then you have to go back to court to get a safety order. And the safety order is for two years. So with the protection order and safety order, they can still come into the house. They can still live there, but they're not allowed to intimidate or harass or abuse you in any which way. And um, But I had asked for him not to be in the house, but the kids needed a, a, a break. So he moved in with his mother next door. And the abuse just hit an all-time high after um, the safety order was put in place. Um, it was, you know, everything from following us, us around the place, stalking us. Um, that he, you know, he was sending these crazy, crazy text messages. He went around to all the neighbours telling them that I was having a midlife crisis and that he was a loving, doting father and he'd never do anything to harm me and the kids. Um, sending messages on how I was allowed to spend my money. Um, like, so if I stopped, I, I used to bring the oldest into the orthodontist and I'd stop to get him a McDonald's and it'd be, you know, that money isn't for, for that. The man, that money is for this. Um, he was taking money out of the account rather than putting it in. Um, then his road rage got really bad. Um, he would, my best friends got an awful hard time from him. He'd, um, speed up, pull out into the middle of the road, um, to scare them, intimidate them. He did it one day when he had our two smallest in his car and our oldest son was in my best friend's car and he he sent my best friend's car into the ditch. And so here we are with our oldest son and he's petrified for the, we call them the babies, two youngest, the babies in the other car and uh, going around with this crazy lunatic. So we were constantly up and down to the police, constantly making reports. Um, you know, he... he I was involved with the, all the networks. So there's COPE, there's Women's Aid, there's the Domestic Violence Response Unit as part of TUSLA over here. Um, there's loads of support networks that are amazing. And if you engage with them, they know so much about the tactics. They were taking my phone, they seen the pattern of behaviour and they were able to preempt what was going to happen next. And they were going to tell me, OK, he's going to either break into the house and steal the contents of the furniture of the house or he's going to break into the shed and steal the contents of the shed. And here's me. He wouldn't do that. You know, he's not going to do that to the kids. What happened? Came home one day and absolutely everything gone from the shed. He stole everything. So it was, everything was spiteful. Everything was, you know, he had to have that last laugh. It was nothing calm for the children. Um, it was, you know, he turned off the water to the house and he came into the house. And on front of our oldest daughter, he's um, again squaring up to me and telling me that I'm a disgrace, that all the neighbours are disgusted with me. Nobody around here is going to help you if you're stuck. You're screwed without me. And my response is, get the fuck out of the house. Um, so th this was going on, stalking them at the school, standing across the road where, you know, he wasn't legally crossing a boundary, but he was doing it so that they could see him and make them uncomfortable blocking them on the road um, when my best friend would be dropping them to or from school, um, getting crazy letters from solicitors, you know, um, accusing us of breaking his mother's property, uh, a window in one, in her vehicle, things like this. And just general counter parenting, you know, whatever the rules and boundaries and schedule and routine was with the kids, he'd completely do the opposite. Um, the kids confided in his family and they didn't believe them they believed him so the kids just blocked them on everything you know they're like if, if, if we can't trust them and that they're not going to protect us we we want out so um that added to the rage because then the kids weren't speaking to their aunties or anything or their grandmother but the kids needed to feel safe they needed to feel like they could speak openly and be trusted um so eventually um he breached the safety order to the point where the, the police and the solicitor was like, you need to make a statement. This is going on long enough. Um, so made the statement, he got arrested and then there were, it was like a barring order was put in place where he couldn't come near the house. So that helped really ease things because the kids needed a break. Um, I also pulled him having the, the smallies, the small kids after school every day and um, because the, when you'd be dropping them back to the older kids, it was causing such upset on them, the way he'd speak to them and what he'd, you know, his looks and again, these micro expressions and everything. And um, then I offered that he could have them every Saturday 
the two small kids. And then it was like, actually, you know, I'll have them every second Saturday. So this was like, what's going on here? Does he want them or does he not want them? I started to see it's all a game. They're still a pawn. He doesn't genuinely want them. He just wants to get at me. So this is with the, the networks involved. I got a bit stronger. I got a bit more confident. I was learning about narcissism and domestic violence and everything. And I was able to hold my own. Um, so eventually he up and fled and left for America um, without letting us know, without saying goodbye to the kids. And um, it was a blessing in disguise because it just gave us a breather. It gave us time to just decompress, not be hyper vigilant um, and enjoy ourselves and enjoy life and doing without um, child support. It was nothing. This was like it was so worth it. You can't buy that peace. You can't buy that calm. And um, so that really helped when he left. Um, and he also realised when he did leave that he did fucking nothing around the house. Nothing. Nothing in my life changed. I was I was doing less work. I was less stressed. I had no arguments in the evening. The kids could just enjoy their house. They weren't hiding anymore. Um, now we're still jumpy and nervous, like loud bangs, um, strange numbers on the phone. If someone come up behind me and, and you know, give me a fright thinking it's fun, it's like the rush of cortisol is a thin through me. I'm not able for it. Um, I find exercise difficult because it's like this rush of cortisol from exercise I don't like because it reminds me of having to fight him. It's that same feeling in my body. Um, we're not out of the woods. We still have um, in Ireland, you have to be separated for two years before you can apply for a divorce. So, you know, we still have a long ways to go, but we'll never be back where we were. I'll never be under that control again. My kids, we've broke the cycle. They broke the cycle. Um, they're amazing. They're confident young kids. Um, and at the end of the day, if he didn't want us speaking out about this ill treatment, then he shouldn't have done it. And it's taken a long time to be brave enough to sit here with you and be able to to say that and, and be happy. And I hope that it gives some other mammies hope that are at the start of this journey that, you know, go get the networks, get the help, get the advice. You will educate yourself. Listen to this podcast and you'll realise you're not alone. And, you know, we'll never be out of the journey as long as you have kids. You're still going to have to deal with them at some stage, at some point. But when you start to know your own mind and be confident in yourself, there is light at the end of the tunnel. And one thing that you didn't point out here at the end is that you still live next door to his parents. Yeah. So even though he is gone yeah, and he's nowhere near you, every morning, you know, that thing is next door to you so what is the interaction there with all of you and even with the kids is there any sort of relationship and when you leave the house do you do you have a, some sort of dread no they have great relief that they don't have to go up there um they have their self-worth they have their other grandparents that give them joy and give them you know that sense of what a grandparent should do you know baking scones with them and going farming with them and and you know picking them up dropping them off you know coming to stay if I need to be away for work they have it they mightn't have it next door but the kids can reach out on the phone and um and do that uh they never had that love and care and attachment to her so they don't miss it um they're very indifferent about her I suppose when you never had the attachment, you don't miss it. And I think that's part of the thing with the two older kids. They definitely didn't have a paternal attachment. Um, their attachment is to me. It wasn't to him. He used to say, you're turning them against me and it's all your fault. But it's not. It's not my responsibility for his relationship with his kids. It's not my responsibility for the kids' relationship with their grandmother. That's that They're taking ownership of their effort. And, you know, their wrongdoings are their wrongdoings. And um, yeah, so I drive up and down with my head high every day. The kids go by, they'll walk by, they don't care. Um, 
as long as we're left alone, we're happy. We don't, we don't care. This is our home. This is where my kids were born and raised. Um, this is their safe place. And the two older kids are adamant that we're not moving because um, he's taken a lot and he's not going to take. This is their space. This is where their friends come. We live beside the beach. This is the, the hub for them and all their friends to go swimming and come back here and hang out. And, uh, you know, I have enough financial strain. I have enough hardship and worry working full time doing crazy hours with four children by myself with no family support around me. Why should I move and give him the satisfaction? Um, you know, just because his poor mammy next door doesn't want us here or, the, you know, it's too hard on them. <laughs> you know, we're, we're doing good. We're our own people now. And uh, yeah, it's lovely to be at this stage. And tell everyone what your name means. Searsha means freedom. So, yeah, it's a big thing. So, you know, with everything that you just told us, your life story here today, you know, do you have any words of wisdom for everyone who is listening? There's a lot of things like, you know, I know I've given a lot of little snippets of stories. The reason I'm doing that is. We listen to a lot of stories here, Brendan, with you where there is massive violence and there's massive aggression and there's these massive red flags where, you know, people find it hard to get out. And and with no doubt, that's why it's because of the violence. But if you see where I was coming from, that I was gaslighting myself with all these small things. But, you know, when you look at the different abuser types and the way he escalated and the way he changed and you know, I ke- me keeping the secrets did not help me. I kept everything a secret from my sister. And the reason I did that with, with my older sister is the one that always protected me when I was small. So I knew if I told her the jig was up, I had to be ready to leave. So I kept it a secret from her. I told my best friend, but my best friend had the approach of I'm here when you're ready to leave. And I needed that best friend. And my other sister who lives far away in Australia, she was my emotional support. So I needed those three people. Find those people. It's so important to have, you don't need a big massive army. You're going to lose loads of friends on this journey because you're going to, and it's going to hurt because you're going to think, you know, especially when you're like me and you're a helper and you're a people pleaser, you want to be everybody's friend. It's going to hurt. But believe me, out of the pain comes a lot of good as well. Um, and making sure, like, look up, you know, the power and control wheel, the post-separation abuse wheel, and just see, like, is there things on that that you can give examples of? And if there is, there are massive signs that you need to get help. And the one person you don't want to tell, that's the person you need to tell. Look for networks. Try and get as much advice and support from your local community as you can. And the biggest thing is face the fear your biggest fear is actually going to be your biggest success. And don't be afraid to do it. If I can do it with four kids, anybody can do it. I was a stay-at-home mom with no money, no job. And you figure it out. A mom is a superpower and use it and trust your kids. If you don't trust yourself, trust your kids. Well, Saoirse... Thank you for being so clear in everything you were saying. Everyone was able to live everything that you dealt with. And you did a really good job of, you know, showcasing, you know, the abuse tactics, who you were dealing with, how you were feeling, you know, a really big 3D version of, of the story. It's not an easy thing to do and to pick what to choose and how to tell your story when it is how many years, like over 20 year relationship, 20 years, 20 years. And you were in, you were trapped for 20 years and to be able to find your way out and to be who you are and to have a smile on your face in the way that you do. You know, it's a real uh, blessing that you're here with us today for everyone who 
is out of it or in their relationship to hear you and what you went through and you're a beacon of hope for everyone. I really can't thank you enough uh, for being here today with us. And also, you know, a big hug to you and your kids uh, for being a big part of your story and who you are and being, you know, them being these strong kids. And I know that they're in therapy too, and they're part of everything. Just a really big thank you for being here today. Thank you, Brandon. Well, thank you once again, Searsha, for being here with us today. And if you want to be a guest like Searsha was today, please do go to our website at NarcissistApocalypse.com. Top of the page, there's a button that says Guest Form. When you click on that button, it takes you to our Guest Form page. There you can read all of our instructions and either send us an email at NarcissistApocalypse at gmail.com or fill out our Guest Form and press the Submit button. And please do send it in the format that we ask for. And if you are someone that needs support, we here at NarcissistApocalypse.com have a support group. So at NarcissistApocalypse.com, top of the page, there's a button that says support group. When you click on that button, it takes you to our very own safe social network. Inside, you'll see that we have Zoom meetings every Wednesday night, Thursday afternoons, and Saturday nights. We also have forum boards for you to post on to get the validation that you need from survivors just like you. It is a wonderful group of people on there. You can share your experiences and make friends as well. So if you need support, join our support group today. And if you need even more support, please do visit our friends at domesticshelters.org. At domesticshelters.org, they have articles and resources to help you make sense of what you're dealing with. They have every phone number and email address, web address for shelters, agencies, no matter how big or small the tenure in domesticshelters.org has it there. It is a wonderful free resource and organization. So if you need extra support, please do go to domesticshelters.org. And then we have another friend of the show called Shelter Movers, and Shelter Movers can be reached at sheltermovers.com. And Shelter Movers helps survivors of domestic violence transition to a better and safer life. It is a volunteer organization and a donor-supported charitable organization as well. And what they do is they help coordinate moves for people who are getting out of domestic violence. They help you to safety, and they get all of your things out of your home and into storage, all of your belongings into storage, and they can do this for your pets and livestock too. It is a wonderful organization. So if you need help from them or just want to donate to them, please do go to sheltermovers.com. And currently this is only available in Canada, but they will be coming into the United States eventually. And that is it for today's episode. So for myself and Searsha, we hope you have a good night.